Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome back to the Shintaro Higashi Show with Peter Yu. Today we're going to talk a little bit about judo strategies. That's right. So last time we talked about different styles of judo around the world. And I think that kind of brings about uh, a lot of diversity in the strategies you need to use to kind of match all the different styles. So I thought That's it would right. be a good, good right. uh, leeway into it. Yeah. yeah. And we're talking a little bit about your Korean judo style versus the Japanese judo style that you sort of picked up from me right. because I'm very heavily influenced by the Japanese judo mm-hmm. machine, right? Right. So you have sort of a hybrid style and, you know, I picked up some stuff from you and uh, <laughs> it's very important to be able to discuss where some of these specifics and these types of ideas and concepts come from, right? right? And then looking at the overall general strategy, then looking at specific strategy, that sort of puts some light on it. And then if you can listen to it and then implement some of these ideas into your own judo system, I think that's a win for everybody, right? Yeah, I think so. And so having said that, why don't we kind of start with the traditional Japanese style, like that, yeah. the, the two hands on, you know, and then we'll kind of branch off from there, like, because that's where awesome. everything started. That's a great place to start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... The traditional classic two hands on, you could be right versus right or right versus left, yeah. ayotsu or kenkayotsu as they call it, right? And that's where it is. You start with two hands on and then you throw. Mm-hmm. That was all of it, right? And that's sort of the beginning of it. And then people have the concept of tokuiwaza, which is your favorite move. Right. You've done 10,000 times, 100,000 times. You could throw anyone and everyone you know, from right. your two hands on. And that's sort of the classical judo style, right? Now it's a little bit... I don't want to say outdated. There's people who live and die by it, right? Yeah. But it's definitely branched off and there's much more diversity in, in world judo now. Right, from that right. Style. So the, do you, would you say you kind of started also from that style and then evolved yeah. from it? Yeah. Yeah. Because so your dad the 50, probably 50 had that. Judo. Yeah. yeah. My father was a big fan of that and he yeah. was old school judo. And you can take the 50-50 position where it's like, hey, you have your right hand on my collar. I have my right hand on your collar. You mm-hmm. have your left hand on my sleeve. I have my left hand on your sleeve. Right. Now we're dead even, same exact position. And I'm blasting away some of my favorite attacks. And you're blasting away some of your favorite attacks. If mm-hmm. you're going for a big turn throw, I'm going to guess and try to defend it. Right? Maybe you fake and you go Ochi. And then maybe right. I catch it and then I try to counter it. Uh, it that Bruce Fort style is very good mm-hmm. you know, for some people. If you're big, strong, athletic, tons of hours in the gym, right. tons of experience... You know, though that's that could go a long way. And there's some people in the world who still fight like that. Yeah, I guess that's why. I mean, a lot of the Japanese players can afford to do that. I guess because they have yeah. a lot of mess time and it's great for that's training. Right. Yeah, that's right. And then the nuances of like person's right. hand is about to move or they feel it. Right? They feel yeah. it. They understand it. There's only a certain number of things that you can do from that position. Right. Right. And then even though when you're adjusting for position to gain slight advantages in hand position, like you kind of feel it, you kind of understand it, you could anticipate it, right? You could Mm. attack and then adjust the position. That's a big part of my sort of teaching. Right, right. So can we talk about that a little, Uh, the little adjustments that you do? I know you emphasize that shoulder roll all the time. Yeah, so right versus right, right hand collar, left hand sleeve. Right. Yeah. If I could bring your collar hand down a little bit and then bring my collar hand right. up a little bit, right? Now the lever arm is much longer from right. the focal arm, from the center of gravity, right? Mm-hmm. Longer the lever arm. So now I have a little bit more control of your upper body. And if we lock in 50 50 Osotogari, I could push your head a little bit more with force and tip you over as opposed to you cannot because your right. hand much lower on my chest, right? Yeah. So that's sort of the idea. Uh, If your hand is very high on my collar here, then I can't turn into that hand. But Mm -hmm. if I have my hand up here, right, I could sort of really force. And then if your hand is low, I could turn my body away. Right. Uh, It's really about controlling posture. Yeah, that's that subtle adjustment. Honestly, like that was one of the biggest, uh, biggest like one of the biggest things I learned from you because it really changed my game like it, it doesn't yeah. you don't really need to do much to gain mm-hmm. the advantage and it's yeah. like kind of like a little subtle shoulder shimmy almost yeah and where where did you i'm kind of curious i mean i've been meaning to ask you like where did you get the idea did you learn it from japan or do uh, yeah i learned something? it from japan i, I oh, okay. was in kukushkan high school right. kukushkan college university you know every time yeah. i went over there they would emphasize that and sometimes even if it weren't explicitly said, I would be doing judo and I would feel my lapel hand sliding like down little by little. I see. And then the more it slid down, the less I was able to attack successfully. I see. Right? 
So then it became a game of like, all right, how do I keep my lapel hand high? Right. How do I bring my opponent's la- lapel hand low? And right. this is specifically in a right side versus right side setting. I see. Right? And a lot of people still kind of do this intuitively. People who have never been taught this mm-hmm. do it intuitively. Right. They just know the higher the hand it is on the collar and the more they could crank on the head, the more that they feel uncomfortable. Right. right. So naturally, intuitively, people are already sort of doing this. But I just happen to teach it explicitly. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, that's very important. You know, like I saw, yeah. I, I think uh, it seems like a lot of like uh, people at Kokushkan kind of picked it up because of the so many yeah. hours on the mat. Yeah. But you know, we don't in America. It's that's hard to do. Yeah. And the, as a teaching tool, it's like you show Sotogari and people are worried about their balance. What do I do right. with my feet? How do I step? What should my hands be doing? They're not really thinking about the starting point of like, okay, here are the cues for me to go into Sotogari. My hand right. has to be, my lapel hand has to be higher than their lapel hand. Right. They're not really thinking that. Uh, and, you know, and I say so like, hey, watch where your hands are. Put right. your hands higher. Gain better advantage. Attack from a position right. of power. And that's sort of, you know, what I yeah. always, always sort of preach. Are there some other little adjustments that uh people do over there in japan mm. or is that yeah for sure general? yeah for sure you know there's a lot of things like if you're losing in position already your ha- opponent's hand is very high on the mm-hmm. lapel and you can't bring that hand down you put your chin over and you lean into that arm right, right. so like you see the 50 50 extreme position like this and then I people see. have their chin over the hand. I that see. way you're leaning away from all the turn throws, all those sotogaris, all their power-oriented attacks. Now, right, all of a right. sudden, the one thing that's available to your opposition is the sasai. Yeah. Right? So now you know the sasai is available for them. They might really blast into it. So you could kind of anticipate it and try to time an ouchi or a kochi or something I like see. that. I see. Or simply just shoving them as they're kind of going back. I see. You know what I mean? So like that's something that you, know, you, you want to have, but mm. that only works on a sophisticated opponent who knows that. Right, you know? right. If you kind of have the opponent's hand up high, you can't take it down, you lean into the arm, person tries to force on a soto, you could counter it, mm-hmm. right? But most good people are not going to go for an soto there. Right, you know? right. But unless you're Shohei, right? <laughs> yeah, Ono, he can, he and can then you have a massive, now. yeah, he could brute force some of that way. So yeah. it really depends on the person's athleticism, how big they are, how strong right. they are, how tall they are, Right. How good they are at Osotogari. Do right. they have a Sasai in the first place? They don't have a Sasai. You don't have to worry about none of it. You could just stay in the pocket down low here, mm-hmm. leaning into the arm and just do judo the whole time and pick at the person's Ouchi, pick at the person's Kouchi, and right. then just looking for your own turn throws. Yeah. So, right? then, so that's like basic right versus right strategy. So in that situation, now that say uh, you... Basically, I want to ask you about the counters to this little shimmy and 50-50 judo... Yeah. Going into the dominant position, uh, this traditional traditional uh, two-handed yeah. judo. Um, mm-hmm. How what do you how do you usually combat that when you can't yeah. really fight the? That's a, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So sometimes I'm locked up 50-50. I put my chin over the hand or yeah. adjust the shoulder and bring the hand down. Now they're also doing the same thing to my right. right hand as well, right? My hand that controls the head, they're pushing it down. So sometimes as they're pushing down, I'll release it and mm-hmm. then pull, right? So now all of a sudden they have this sort of emotion, right? And then yeah. their posture comes back Oof. up. And now when it's up high here, they release the pressure on this arm here. Mm. So now this is a good time for me to bite the hand up or go in for a soto or something right. like this. Or maybe when they do that, you know, you attack the feet and then you take the hand off, right? I so see. you can not just squeeze and put pressure, but you can cut the hand off, right? I mean, that's so better like than 50-50. Yeah, it's better than 50-50. Yeah. Right? So that's something that you can do. I know uh, when the arm is pinned, you could roll the arm inside the gi and then try to bring your opponent's hand to the inside of the the sleeve. I see. And then you throw your arm across to cut that hand. Right? I made a couple videos about that in the right side versus right on my YouTube. Yeah. So, and you know, you can't just do one of these. Right. It's very nu- nuanced, right? So sometimes they put pressure on and you try to roll the elbow and then cut the hand. doesn't work. They're still pressuring down. You're rolling the hair and pulling them off balance. You're attacking the feet. You're cutting their hand, right? There's a lot going on. You know, it's kind of like uh, like drumming. You know, right. one hand's doing something. The other hand's doing another thing, right? You're trying mm-hmm. to keep your balance by keeping your feet underneath you. Mm-hmm. You're trying to monitor some of the different attacks that he may do. Right. You know, so it gets kind of complicated, but this is one of those things like you could learn over time by doing and doing and doing of course you could watch youtube videos right uh it, it's a very that's what makes judo a very tricky thing yeah right it's for very me tricky. yeah for me i think uh yeah th- these things take time but i for me what helped was you know 
you you laid out some of the big pictures mm. to the students, like the little shimmy, yeah. you know, the basic idea how you got to pin the elbow and then you want your uh, lapel hand to go high. So from yeah. there, everything kind of flows out, right? I think yeah. that's a good way to look at it. Like you emphasize yeah. it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And then you could have one hand attached, right? So like yeah. now all of a sudden you have two hands on and they have their sleeve you completely controlled and they rip that hand away. Mm. Now you have one hand on, it's your right hand or something. Now you have to have a weak side epon saying ag. Right. If you don't, you don't really have any threats from there. Now you're losing because they have a short dominant turn and mm. now you have a weak side long turn. Right. right? So like a long distance left epon saying agi versus a short distance right epon right. saying agi right. off this hand that shouldn't be on, like I'm losing in that position, mm -hmm. theoretically, right? So being able to deal with that is important. I the see. advantage of being able to grip is you don't have to do a lot of this stuff, right? If I could put my first hand on and then if I could put myself in that completely dominant position, right, then I don't really have to worry Water. about the person adjusting or squeezing or moving the shoulder or none of that stuff because right. you're not starting in 50-50, right. right? You have your one hand on, you're attacking, attacking, attacking. And by the time you get your two hands on, you're already fully dominant. Right. So you've already shut off everything that they already uh, potentially have. Right? That's, yeah, that's where your uh, one-handed judo comes from, right? Like how, how to even start. Like you don't even, you don't even yeah. try to go right away into the uh, double hand grips, really. Sometimes I do. Oh, so sometimes do. if I'm doing one-handed grip, one-handed grip, mm -hmm. and I'm consistently right, so it depends on how I'm finding right side versus left side. But right. Let's talk right versus right because it's yeah. most common and it's a lot easier to understand. So I want to put this left hand on, sleeve lapel, sleeve lapel, right? So offense hand, defense hand, right? So mm -hmm. defending my sleeve, every time they go for the lapel, I'm parrying, moving and punching and punching. But if I do that every single time, right, of course, there's some variations to it. Mm -hmm. Then people are going to start understanding. Maybe they're very good in that position. So I'm going to look like I'm going to go for two hands and then I just jump and go double hands. I right? see. Sometimes I'll do that, you know, uh, every now and then once every three or four exchanges or something like that, just to mix it up. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, uh, you know, I haven't been caught right off of that yet, you know, right. so that's something that uh, can definitely be available to you. I see. So the one handed attack, uh, the grip fighting yeah. strategy uh, you do, actually I used to do it backwards and then I got caught a lot because I have a left if, I'm a righty, but I have a left influence yeah. on I guess. So because I was so confident with it, sometimes I would lead with my right hand in my one-handed yeah. grip fighting and grab the, uh, grip their lapel, yeah. and I'll get counter. So it, yeah. can you just kind of go over the actual strategy you use, kind of, kind of pinning down the uh, sleeve hand and whatnot, the attack hand? Yeah. With the one -handed so judo. if the person's leading hand, leading yeah. right, I'm leading right, and if I could grab that lead hand and that sleeve, and I could bring it down, right, that hand needs to be on my lapel to control my posture. Right. Right now, I control it completely. I fully have it. I have one hand on, he has zero hands on, mm -hmm. and then I'm attacking one handed tatoshi, one handed ponsenagi, arm drag. If you want to just take the person's back, right. As I'm attacking for all those things, I fake one thing, I go for another, maybe show sode, and then I throw this right hand over the back, mm -hmm. right. So now they're completely dominated, and from there and only there do I start launching my kochi, ochi, mm -hmm. sai, osoto, big turn throws, like these forceful big attacks. Yeah. You're different and unique because you have a lot more attacks to the left as well. Right. Not only do you just go for right side, uh, left side ipon sayanagi off that right hand lapel, which is to the weak side, you also go for it and go for that far osotogare to the left side. You have a left right. side osoto off that ipon sayanagi. Yeah. Right? And then you go for that, and then you miss, and then you go drop Sanagi. Mm. So it's a pretty good system. You have three attacks at a weak side off of that hand. So that's a very dangerous thing that Peter does that you should watch out for <laughs> if you ever fight him. Now. <laughs> yeah. But I, I used to, but I think my problem was before you pointed that out to me, I would just go for that right away instead yeah. of fighting my right-handed judo first like so i will yeah. start you know starting with the pinning yeah. down the sleeve hand attacking my regular osoto ochimaras yeah. whatever yeah, and the then right kind of yeah. and then kind of surprising them and that was another yeah. big eye opener for me yeah that's right because if you're just you know leading right and then you want to do most of your attacks to the right, but instead of fighting to get into that right side versus right side position, yeah. you're putting yourself in a bad position and attacking right. off of that, you know, the wrong side, right? It's not really wrong, but it's the wrong side. Yeah. And you're only doing that, that should be sort of a surprise attack. Yeah. Right? 
and it, everyone expects you to have one attack to the to the left, the weak side. Right. right. Whether it's Sasai or Lefty Ponce and Agi or Sode. Some people have Sode if they're mm. pretty slick. Then you have Kataguruma and all that stuff. Uh, but generally, people have one or two attacks to the weak side. You have three, three mm-hmm. or four, maybe even five. You have a left side, one-handed Tayo. Right. <laughs> Oh, Made yeah. a video about Put that. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or, or write that in. You know, if you're fighting Peter, uh, <laughs> if you're ever gonna fight him in Detroit area, uh, <laughs> keep that in mind. So what you want to do is like right side, right side, right side, fighting for position, fighting for position, attacking off one hand to the right side, strong hand. Put two hands on. Ouchi kochi, uchimata. You're doing all your judo, 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 and then all of a sudden you find yourself in this left side, mm. and then you go free pon senagi. Right. Someone very good, it might not work. But they're definitely not expecting you to go Ipon Sanagi or Sotogari into Drop Sanagi, right? And then, and then now we're fighting, 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 and then you get outgripped. You get yeah. one hand, you they control your sleeve first, right? And you're like, get off me, get off me. And they have and then, no clue that you're going to turn and do a left side one handed tie up. Right. And that's that's your secret weapon, really. Yeah. And that's, you know, that actually, even if those like my left side attacks fail, that actually yeah. opens up. The other side, like my right side of judo. Yeah, so I think yeah. it really going back and forth really helps. And yeah. I and showing that too soon is a problem too, right? Because right. all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm out gripping this person to the left, to mm-hmm. right versus right, and this person's kind of fighting mostly to the left. Let me shut that stuff down. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Once I'm comfortable with that, now for you to return and to beat me as a right versus right is going to be a little bit trickier. Right. Right, it needs to be surprised. I mean, you could go both ways, really. Yeah, you know what I mean. And you have some good side, left sided attacks. But to me, knowing your judo, I know your right side stuff is a lot more powerful. Right, right. Yeah, like you could string together more stuff. You could go force Uchimata to the right. Yeah, right. You're comfortable being on that left leg. You know, Ochi Uchimata turn Osoto right. fake the technique, go to side snap down. You know, Korean saying that whatever. You're good at all that stuff. So because you're mostly right handed. Mm-hmm. Right, you could kind of sort of depend, you know, adjust your strategy based on that. Right. But if they don't know, right, you could mostly be doing left-handed stuff, left-hand stuff, left handed stuff, left-handed stuff, then surprise them right-hand too. Yeah. So that's an option as well. Right. So that comes into sort of like the game. Yeah. I think it's not game theory, but it's this idea of like, do they know your style? Yeah. Imperfect they've information. Been watching you? Yeah. <laughs> information, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, a lot of people, if they're not skilled and if they don't have the intelligence to break not intelligence but like judo iq, judo IQ to break yeah. this stuff this down yeah like all that information knowing this stuff it's not going to mean anything right right because your body has to keep up with some of this mental stuff too mm-hmm. it, right? it becomes very cerebral and i remember i love talking to you about like ma- my matches or other matches because you know you can yeah. kind of see right away even from the sideline you know yeah and but those those uh pe- Check out uh, Shintaro's commentary, like the Randori commentary videos. They're really informative. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have some great strategy, you know, pretending to tap in a tournament and yeah. then not actually tapping. You know, like, well, that, that was a great one, right? That's, yeah, a, that's, a that's, a, that's my uh, secret weapon. Yeah. So Peter, you tap like you tap like this so the referee can't see. And the guy's like, you tap. And Peter's like, I, I don't know I don't what you're talking about. Yeah. That's the best strategy you've ever seen in judo. Man. Right. That, that's Yeah, I think yeah. that was my... Uh, I, I probably should have quit judo back, back yeah. then. <laughs> so That's now awesome. we talked about the same side of stuff, you know, going from yeah. starting from one hand, getting the diamond and two hand grip, adjusting yeah. and all that. How about offside, like the right, left, right versus left situation? Yeah. That's a total, so, total different yeah, situation. Yeah, it's a totally yeah. different thing. And, you know, we're when we sort of have this conversation, we're assuming that the person's a true lefty and they have 90% of their attacks going to the left side. Right. Right. And then I'm a true righty and I have 90% of my attacks going to the right side. Right. Right. So inside versus outside configuration, right side versus left. Right. Mm-hmm. Because it's not exactly the same. If we both have our lead arm on the opponent's collar, right. one arm is going to be underneath. One arm is going to be over the top. One arm is going to be inside, one arm is going to be outside. Right? right. So that's the battle first. That's the first battle. Putting that first end on to determine who gets inside control or outside control. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people like outside control and I like inside control. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Right. I put my hand on. They put their hand over. Comfortable. They put their hand on over the top. I'm like, oh, I like inside anyway. Mm-hmm. Go for the inside. Right. And some people say inside is always better. That's not necessarily true. Yeah. I have to reiterate that. If you're on the outside player and you know that position really well, that's good for you. Mm-hmm. Right? Not inside's always better. You know, if you're much taller than the person going inside, 
can be good, but you know, maybe you like going on the outside. Who knows, right? And pulling mm. the person in, squeezing the person in. So if you have your hand on first, I like inside, you like inside, you come underneath, I say, nope, and I could close this window. Right. Right. Now they cannot have access to this lapel. They have to go around, see all this space over the top. And mm-hmm. as you're going for it, I create this frame here. Right. Mm. I create the frame, sleeve. You need a strong post in between your body and their body. So now they can't close this distance. That's the big idea, right? The uh, controlling that distance between you and your opponent, and so that you have space to go in for your throw. Yeah, you have controlling the distance, which is kind of an esoteric thing, right? It's Mm -hmm. hard to really understand what does it mean to control the distance, right? You know what I mean? And I, I like to put it in a way where if I have inside control, if I don't want the person to come closer to me, I could prevent that with the strong elbow post or mm. if i could physically push with a nice strong post here right? right but if he the person has their elbow over and then has crunched my arm down in this weak angle now even if i want to push the person in because my arm is scrunched in this way i can't really push him away from right me. like right? bench press That's, versus you know yeah yeah bench press versus like a, a shoulder, shoulder lateral fly, yeah. fly fly situation so that's one portion of it mm-hmm. once you have a strong post on the opponent you grab the sleeve and then you could physically push and pull to turn the person's shoulder, right? Right. And because we're trying to throw in the same space, like for right versus left, we're both trying to throw here, yeah. right? If I could turn their shoulders towards me this direction a little bit better, it's a lot easier for me to throw them here, mm-hmm. right? So control the distance, create a post, and then turning the shoulder is sort of the grip fighting slash uh, positional adjustment thing. Right. right. I think grip fighting is a little bit more prominent in the right versus left. Uh right versus right. Yeah. Because you're fighting for that lapel hand coming down and up, right? Right, and right. You're breaking and you're breaking. Right versus left is a little bit less grip fighting. Mm. Less. Less. Right? It, and there's a little bit more judo. I see. Because you, you I guess, yeah, you you're just you kinda have to ha- just let each other grip the lapel and then kind of go for it from there i'll just yeah. think that right versus right you're turning into each other's arms you're right turning into each other's techniques i spin this way you spin that way we're turning in and against right. each other and the thing that's really preventing it is this hand so mm-hmm. you have to freaking fight for it and take the hand off and this and that right 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 versus left even if you have a strong post I'm not completely losing i still kind of attack yeah. and turn my hips so right. now it's fighting for that sleeve and then getting that shoulder turn right right so there's and, a little bit yeah of less grip fighting so and then the interesting bit of, about uh, turning your opponent's shoulder yeah. in the right left uh, com- configuration. So in that, it's sometimes that's hard to do because I think when the left uh, my opponent shuts that down, yeah. that 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 turn with their hip, yeah. kind of trying to w- applying the downward force with their whole body with the yeah. starting from the hip, like and w- so how do you? How, is there any trick to that? What's your strategy when they try to uh, shut everything down and going to that direction? You know, so if they like turning with their hips, then I open them up with a sasai because naturally I that's going to be sort of weak, right? And then right. if I'm pushing and pulling and they're resisting back this direction, I could uh. release and go sasai this way, which is going to take them off balance over here. And as they return to neutral, that's when I post this hand and then fight for mm. the sleeve back. But it really does come down to this posting Post, arm yeah. because... If my arm is scrunched from the inside, right? I have inside control, they have outside control, and they've done a good job of holding this arm down. Mm-hmm. Now that they're pulling this hand and turning my shoulder, it's very difficult for me to just pull their entire body with this one arm. Right. right? I need to be able to push and pull to physically turn them. Right. right. So it's a little bit of like, you know, I need to keep this fight arm strong in order to return this hand. Mm-hmm. I'm going to use society to open him up first and then bring him back. Right. So there's a little bit of a, a game there. Right. You know, you, do you have a lead like Dayashi, like a sticker mm-hmm. Dayashi, or you like, do like a heel hook Dayashi, I like to call it too. Mm-hmm. You know, do you have that? Do you have an Ouchi there to return that person's leg to have them a little bit more square so you could win this position? Like mm-hmm. those things all really come into play. That's another big, uh, big idea, I guess, the action reaction. Like, you know, if, yeah. if one way doesn't work, go the other way so that you can come back to it stronger. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so a lot of it is pattern recognition, right? Like let's say yeah. gripping, you know, it gets pretty complicated, but you know, we're pretty much even even. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're winning, you know, advantage a little bit, sometimes I'm winning by a little bit and it's dead even, 50-50. Now gripping sort of out of the game. Right. Right? 
Like you, you're not winning. If you're out gripping the person every single time, you have you know ten exchanges in a match, exchanges in like thirty second shots. Yeah. But to throw the person, you know, for ten out of ten, you're in a great position. The likelihood of you getting taken down are a lot less, right? Because right. you're attacking from a better position. Right. Right. So you don't have to think about it. But now, if we're like sort of splitting the difference, mm-hmm. right? Half the time you're in great position. Half the time, I'm in great position. Now, a lot of it is like pattern recognition of attacks. If you're constantly going for ochi, 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 even though I'm in a losing position, as you're coming in, I could try to counter it because I know it's coming. I can anticipate right. it. Right. You know what I mean? So the action reaction stuff is true, mm-hmm. right? Right, 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 left, right? Mm-hmm. Forward, 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 back. Mm-hmm. You know? High attack, high attack, high attack, drop Sanagi. Mm-hmm. Right? The one thing that really doesn't work is drop Sanagi, drop Sanagi, Sanagi. drop Sanagi, drop Sanagi, <laughs> drop Sanagi, you get strangled, right? I used to do that. <laughs> spam, spam, spam. <laughs> We've Sanagi. all done it at some point. Yeah. You know, trying to learn some kind of a drop attack. Yeah. And then getting stuffed and getting choked. We've right. all been there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> it really does. Um, yeah. So we cover right, left. And another, uh, more, another popular question is stiff farming. Like how do yeah, you I deal just made with a stiff full farming. video on yeah. this at, with Judo Fanatics? Good, good. Full blown yeah. video series. That so can we yeah. cut, uh, let's talk about a little bit about that? How how you deal with what 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 kind of strategy you employ to yeah. deal with stiff arm? Opponents? That's a very interesting question, right? Because it's not very relevant to competition, right? Because if you're stiff arming your opponent and you know, you're just stiff arming and just keeping the person away and defending. Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, you're not really actively trying to throw the person, which will get you penalized in judo. Right. It's the equivalent of in wrestling. If you're backing out the whole time and you're not actively trying to take the person down, the, the referee says it's passive, right? You're yeah. passive. Yeah. You know, you're losing points. You're penalty, penalty, passive, passive. You're not trying to take the person down. Mm-hmm. Same thing in judo, mm-hmm. right? Stiff arm, stiff arm. You're not trying to actively throw. You're doing negative judo. Right. Right. Not positive judo where you're trying to slam the person. You're scared. You're weak. Mm-hmm. You're going back. You're not doing nothing. You know, penalty, team penalty. So this is only really relevant in training. Mm-hmm. I learned this new Sanagi. The person stiff arming me. I learned this Osotogari. The person's just trying to create distance and not get thrown. Mm-hmm. Those things are a real issue. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the times, stiff arming. One of my favorite ways to counter it is not trying to go into the person because that's where the strongest. Right. right. So as they're pushing you away, you go in the opposite direction. Try to strip that hand. Mm-hmm. Oh. If you can strip one of the hands, now all of a sudden, right? And the way to do it is if you do like an Ochi or something and then you want to create body separation between you and the other person. Right. So now it's your body going this way, my body going this way, and the tension of that is all in the person's hand connecting to your gi. Right. right? And then you attack it by adding force to that tension. Mm-hmm. Right. That way, that's the only way to really take it. Because if we're standing still, you have my lapel, and I'm trying to physically just take it off with one hand. That literally is my pushing strength versus your gripping strength. Right. And you know, you got gorilla hands. <laughs> <laughs> there are some right? tricks with the grips, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like that that's that's the, the first trick. Yeah. Right? I see. And then are you able to attack off of that posted hand on the lapel? Some people right. have great soda. Mm-hmm. You know? Not not me. I mean I have a decent soda, but right, I'm not too comfortable. It's not one of my main things. So it's like having sode, having a Korean Sayanagi, mm-hmm. right? being able to go the opposite direction, cut that hand, mm-hmm. right? You could adjust from there and then snap the person down and create angles and attack the legs. All these different uh, things come into play. I see. The right? another Basic thing, strategies of stiff yeah. arming, yeah. Another thing I learned throughout the years is that when someone is stiff arming you, you actually want to do the opposite and then stay more relaxed to yeah. allow yourself to enter uh, your throws and mm-hmm. then kind of instead of doing the traditional kuzushi you you can kind of because they're so stiff you don't yeah. need to do much of the kuzushi because they uh, you don't uh they'll they're already kind of going over with the stiff with the stiffness do what do you do you think there's any like validity in that kind of somewhat you know you could always say like oh the person's stiff now i have to go soft you know yeah. and <laughs> kind of go like that <laughs> yeah but like, uh, I guess it's yeah. not really actionable. It's not. I used to hear that a lot, but I, w- I used to get confused. Like, okay, what are? Yeah. What does that exactly mean? I mean, you could like, also say things like, "Oh, the person's stiff, therefore he's not that quick." Now you right. have to be faster and quicker by right. being softer, right? Right. That, it really doesn't really help you. Right. I think it, you, know, you know what I mean. It's yeah. So like yeah, the, I get those things, and uh, 
you know, but that's not really an actionable thing. If I yeah. here's a little bit more of an actionable one. If they're stiff upper body and they're posting mm-hmm. away and their hips are back, now are also they're defensive. Mm-hmm. That creates a big space underneath their arms, right? Right. And going for a turn throw might be difficult if they're double posted on your shoulder because now you can't turn your shoulders and change levels. But right. if you could pull them forward into your body and then slip underneath for tomoinage, right? Right. Right. But do you have a tomoinage? Right. Do you have a straight tomonage? Do you have a yoko tomonage? Can you fake the tomonage and cut the hand? And then now all of a sudden you're dominant and you're stuffing this head down and you're right. kicking him in the shed. Right? Can you do that? Right. Mm-hmm. And having many different strategies and having one or two of them where you could actually throw the person off of it is important. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, yeah, you kind of have to be a little bit gentle and soft and smooth to be able to implement a lot of this stuff. Because if they're stiff and you're stiff and you're locked up like this, right. like nothing's happening. Right. You know? And that's what you see when you have two beginners. Right. Who don't want to get thrown, mm-hmm. locked up 50-50, and then one person lunges at the other person's knees with an osoto, and, and now you got yep. an injury. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, telling a beginner, like, you have to be more less stiff, you have to be more relaxed, doesn't really help them. Yeah. Because it does. they don't, uh, why, what? you know? And it's like, they understand it conceptually, like, why I should be more loose to be more athletic. Right. Right. And they watch sports, you know, Tom Brady throwing the football. They're like, you're not stiff and tense, like not yeah. holding the ball as hard as he can. And then, right, he's like loose moving, right? right? Boom! Exploding into these movements. If you look at an Olympic lifter in the bottom pocket position where they're about to do like a clean and jerk, right? They're not mm-hmm. like stiff at the bottom of the movement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they are because they have to like stiff and brace their core. But right, they're not... Squ- Maybe that's not a good example. <laughs> well, they have to stay. You where I'm, uh, yeah, you have to stay explosive, and that require. Yeah, there, it's it's yeah. more about flexibility. It has to do with flexibility too. It's not just the brute strength, and yeah. Yeah, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, I think I, I sometimes like when beginners ask me for advice, I tend to say that, but I forget that it's more about. Like you said, you have to give them actionable items to get to yeah. the, get there instead of yeah. just reiterating yeah. the goal state. Yeah. Yup. Yep. That's, that's so a, yeah, we got stiff armed, bent over. It's very similar. And you want to get right. good at each one of these things, right? If you don't know how to counter a stiff arm, you can't really train and get better at certain techniques. So you have to kind of break through that. Yeah. Even though you won't see it in competition, it's a skill set that you need to improve your judo. Right. Right. You need one hand attacks, two hand attacks, adjusting for position when you're linked up. You need one hand attacks to threaten the Mm. two hand attacks. And long time ago, there was no handed attacks. Right. right? Which means you could just shoot it on the legs. That was long range judo. Right. Persons coming towards you with their hands up high. You just change levels and shooting on the leg without having any hand control. Right. And that was a thing. You know, and it's a little bit different than wrestling because if you're able to reach out and touch the person in judo, they could grab your gi. Mm-hmm. And now all of a sudden, that's not really coming off. You have to actively take that hand off. Mm-hmm. As opposed to wrestling, they could reach out and touch your, post your hands on your shoulder. You could literally just pop it right off and then shoot it on the legs. Right, right. right. So the range that you're shooting from in judo is a lot further out. Because mm-hmm. if you're close enough to touch the person, they're going to be gripping your gi. And you can right? just stuff, stuff the shoot. The shot. I mean, yeah, yeah, it depends on who's shooting too, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So you had the no-handed judo, the one-handed judo, then you had the two-handed judo. That was sort of the idea back in the day. Right. 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 But now there is no more. You can't just shoot in on the legs anymore. So now there's one-handed judo and two-handed judo. Mm-hmm. And when you're gripping, you can sort of jump the line and not have to adjust. I you see. You can put yourself in a dominant position. Right. And you can be very, very effective gripper if you could throw off that one hand. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So the next portion of the strategy that's really important that you need to know how to do is the transitions to Newaza. Right. Before Newaza, right? Just transition to Newaza. If you're winning in position, Mm -hmm. the opponent's going to go for a bad bailout attack. Right. And I like to teach my bailout attacks as Tomonage, Sumigaishi, Ipon Sayanagi, Drop Sayanagi. Because those three things can effectively get you out of that position and transition the match down to the ground. Mm -hmm. Right. So how do you attack that? You know, and that's right. another strat- strategical thing. Yeah. So the, the I think because in judo the typical judo practice you kind of separate those out. You know, the standing mm-hmm. portion and the newaza. So a lot of times people yeah. don't get enough uh, training or a- a- even an a- emphasis on the transition. So yeah. 
Besides the yeah, so let's start with the bailout tax. Like, um, mm. what kind of situations you look for, you look to do bailout tax, and then when you do bailout tax, what yeah. are the, some of the things you need to be cautious of? Mm. Yeah. So if I'm fighting you right versus right, your hand is high on my collar, controlling my head, you're right. pulling my head down, and my hand is let's just say completely lost right. and down by your stomach on mm-hmm. the collar, which means I can't really throw you a soda or any turn throw. Mm-hmm. Right. I need to get out of that position. It's only a matter of time until you like fake the turn, snap me down, create an angle, cut at my knees, kick me in the shin, snap me down. Yeah. Until you blast in for a big massive uchimata or something. Right. You know what I mean? And then if you have a really nasty uchimata, I don't want to be subjected to that. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to be exposed to that sort of risk. Therefore, I'm going to take it to the ground. Right. Right. Which means if I go straight tomonage, yoko tomonage to the side, you know, connect my left shin to your lead leg and drop to the side, yoko tomonage, bring my right foot up to your hip. Right. Whether I throw you or not, you end up sort of in the in top guard, position. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be in the bottom position, mm-hmm. right? And then from right there, what do we do? You know, right. I'm being trained to be able to attack, like if you're on bottom, like shin to shin guard. Mm-hmm. We'll go for, for a tripod sweep. Mm-hmm. And then you on top being able to stuff that Tomonage and going for an over under pass, pass immediately, yeah. which is the best pass for judo because the rule sets kind of change how Newaza is fought. Right. Right. And attacking that. Or maybe if you go for a drop Sayanagi, I already have the hand on the collar. As you're dropping, I'm already setting up my loop choke. Mm, yeah. Not my loop choke or the, the clock choke. Right, right. Or the British strangle. Yeah. Right? It's different attacking those transitional moments than person misses a throw. Ah, we drop to the floor. You're turtled up. And then I land on top. I'm like, okay, here we go. We're going to go for a strangle now. Right. Right. It's a little bit different. Right, right. So the... The, uh, the attacking the transition. So I did have a question about that because I do I do a lot of drop seiwinage, and you you yeah. counted that as like a bailout attack. So if I'm doing the drops, if I did the drop seiwinage, yeah, how do I can I effectively attack that transition? Yeah. And so re- if you do the drop seiwinage, boom. Yeah. There's ways the person defends the seiwinage. Right. Right. If they if you're dropping and turning. To your left, mm-hmm. right? I could go in the opposite direction and I could let you go through this hole here, right? Right. And then right. I could step out through there. Kind of throw but your body to the other side. So opposite side yeah, of the yeah, Sayanagi. Yeah. As opposed to like if I'm here and you're dropping Sayanagi and you want to throw me that way, I step through this way, right? So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you do that, yeah. right? As we're missing the, maybe you don't get the Sayanagi, right? My arm is going to be end up in this position, mm-hmm. right? So then you could grab it and then tuck yourself and roll underneath. Ah, I see. That's a, a possibility. I see, right? I see. Now, if I step towards the side of the technique, now yeah. you're right prime time for the right. Okuri Arijime or the clock choke, right? Can you pull guard from there? I see. And right? you, Can you pull guard effectively and then attack that arm right away? Mm-hmm. You know, And if you could do it instantaneously and if you train to do so, right, that's something that you could do. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's different from like, oh, this guy just dropped Sanagi just to get out of the thing. And now we're doing Nawaza. And now I don't really want to do Nawaza. And now like, oh, looking at the ref or like, <laughs> right? Yeah. As opposed to like, drop Sanagi, boom. Oh, shoot. He's cracking on my arm. Oh, my God. I got out of there. Right. I'm dominant. I'm about to throw your soto. Drop Sanagi, boom. Right? I go for the clock choke, but now you're pulling guard. And all of a sudden, you're trying to sweep me. And I'm like, oh, shoot. My base. My base. Right, right, right. Right? It's a totally different uh, set of strategies. Right. You know what I mean? But generally speaking, when you miss a drop Sayanagi, you're in a worse position. Yeah. Because if the person has very, very good attacking the back system, then you're going to be in trouble. Especially they're anticipating your drop. And like you said, yep. they could. I, I've yeah. gotten that a lot. Just loop chokes and yeah, clock yeah. chokes. Yeah, clock chokes mostly. Right? Yeah. And the British strangle. Yeah. So Tomonagi but- too. And it's a little bit different from being good at Nawaza period when mm. you're training for Nawaza. Right. Uh, because when you're going into the newaza, the transitions that you're going to be attacking, mm-hmm. you could be proactively bringing the match to the ground or you could be reactively bringing the match to the ground, mm-hmm. right? The difference being like right versus right, you know, you have the chin down, I kick the leg for the sasai and then I drop you to your knees and I've proactively taken you down. Right, right. Into transition newaza and I could go for that British strangle right away. Right. Or I'm snapping you down, going for Tomoinagi and trying to go for Jujai, proactively trying to take you down to the ground. As opposed to you going for Tomoinagi to bail out of a technique or actually trying to throw, maybe even from dominant position, mm-hmm. right? I'm reactively 
taking the match to the ground now and then going for the over under pass. Right. So and you have to train both. You have to train both. Yeah. And this is an interesting topic, especially because it had. I think we uh, this topic has uh, some relevance to BJJ. Um, yeah. So yeah. a lot of times, you know, BJJ practitioners <coughs> want to take the fight to the ground, so they like mm. sometimes <coughs> jump guard and whatnot. Yeah. So, th- wh- how do you? <clears throat> How, what would you recommend for BJJ practitioners to f- maybe focus or what kind of strategy would you recommend to them to effectively mm-hmm. kind of exploit this transition period? Yeah. So it depends uh, what the rule sets are, right? It right. depends. Are you talking about training or competing? If you're trying to compete in judo, I've seen like unbelievable, unbelievable Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners yeah. get down to the ground and now they have one, two, three, four, five to improve position or the referee says stop, get back up to your feet. Right. Right. And I've seen them go to the ground, you know, five or six times and not being able to capitalize because the guy is just really tight looking at the ref like, okay, once they five, you know, and then they're kind of getting pissed off and like, why is this? And then people are saying things like, oh, they're favoring the judo guy and they're not giving a BJJ guy enough time, Apple enough time to do Niwaza, but it's all within the rule sets. Right. Right. The rule sets are guiding that decision. And yeah, is there favoritism? With the referee, of course there is always. We're all human. There's all yeah. people are always gonna pay, play favorites, right? Especially me. <laughs> <laughs> right? But that's the thing, you know. Uh, playing to different rule sets really matter, right? right? If you're trying to compete in judo and you already have a big jujitsu background, you want to develop your techniques that's gonna bring the match to the ground fast, and you can attack right away those transitions I talked about. Right. The person who did this super successfully is Flavio Canto. Right. He has a side tomonage into the kanto choke. Yeah. Instantaneous, fast. Bring the match to the ground, go for the choke. Boom, 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 boom. It has to be that kind of a thing. Right. You know what I mean? Even the passes, like all the BJJ passes that you may learn, knee cut, uh, Toriander pass, uh, yeah. X pass, this pass, that pass, dragon pass, you know, whatever pass, none of that stuff's going to work because the rule sets don't penalize you Oh, the person's passing my guard. I'm going to go to my stomach. In jiu-jitsu, you get penalized for that. Right. You pass the guard, you get points. You give up your back, you get you give up points. Right? Because the goal is to strangle. Mm-hmm. If in judo, someone does an X-pass to me in a competition, I'll just go to my stomach. And if I could hold that position, no forward progression, one, two, three, four, five, referees just say, stop, get back up to your feet. Right. 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 Will I do that in practice? Never. Because now all of a sudden I'm giving up my back. Time doesn't stop. Time keeps going. It gives him a better position. Now he's going to slowly strangle me. Mm-hmm. Right? Attack my arm. Go for the choke. Attack my arm. Go for the choke. Stripping my hands. Seatbelt. I can't really move. I'm trying to escape. I can't really escape because his chin's t- tucked t- tight on my shoulder. Right? So in practice, I would never do that. But in a tournament, of course I would. Yeah. Because the rules are different. Right. You know what I mean? Same thing in guard position. Like, yes, you could go for Tomonage, be in bottom position, and go for the Delahiva, right? But the Delahiva works because the person is in a bent, straight, uh, bent knee position coming into the technique, and his goal is to pass. Right, right. If he doesn't really want to pass, and if he's just standing there, and if he could stay keeping a wide base for one, two, three, four, five, or if he's going to say, Mate, get back up to your feet. Right. Because that's the name of the game if you're competing, right? So if you're trying to do judo as a BJJ practitioner, you know, first you have to learn how to grip, mm-hmm. not being in bad positions so you don't get thrown. Mm-hmm. Second, you have to be able to actively take the person down. Uh, you know, not take the person down necessarily, but transition fast and attack fast mm-hmm. based on the judo niwaza rule set. Mm-hmm. Right? And I think those are really two sort of important things. But this is the thing. If you're just training to do that and win in competition, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice Mm -hmm. because you're not being an overall grappler, right? Right. You're not really learning some of these other beautiful positions, beautiful techniques, beautiful things and ideas and concepts and movements Mm -hmm. that is like the most unbelievably, you know, amazing thing. That's what you're there for, right? To get better. Competition is only a small portion of this. Right. Right. That's why I'm not like a huge competition advocate. Right. Because you're only learning grappling in a very small subsection and it's necessary to have those really restrictive rules because it's kind of got to be safe it's kind of got to be spectator friendly there's so Mm -hmm. many different forces at play 
as opposed right. to like me and you, we're going to make each other better. We're going to grapple, hang out, get beers after this, and it's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. that's, uh, it, yeah, approaching, approaching judo as an art and then the holistically, not just like a, like a, a means, like a tool to just win competitions. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. And yeah. another thing I wanted to ask about now that we're talking about BJJ a little bit, uh, you know, a lot of other arts that allow leg shooting, especially um, mm -hmm. come into judo and then they kind of have this bent over posture. Yeah. Um, so what do you think about that posture? Is it advantageous or uh, why do judo players tend to, you know, maintain the upright posture and yeah. how to deal with the bent over posture? Yeah, so the bent over posture with the stiff arm makes it very difficult, right? Because right. you create separation up here, and now you're creating separation from your center of base to your legs, right? right. So your legs are far away, mm. so, right? So from the point of your hand, which connects to the opponent's gi, and your feet are very, very That's separated. Far, yeah. So now for you to access the feet is very difficult, mm -hmm. right? So you need to be able to have a tomonage or a fake tomonage, and then you could snap. Now, it's a lot easier to snap someone down that way, mm -hmm. right? But they have double collar, right? And they're hanging on tight. It's very difficult to bring their posture down. So you may have to go the opposite direction, cut one of the hands, mm -hmm. right? And if they're hanging just on one hand, now you could start moving and creating angles and snapping them down, faking tomonage and doing all these different ideas. Right, right. Right? So it is a good thing. You know, people say, oh, don't hunch over. That's defensive posture. But sometimes you just need to be in a defensive posture. It's right. defensive posture for a reason. It's defensive. Yeah. Right? And of course, now you, when you take that posture, you're not capable of attacking mm -hmm. because you separated your hips and legs so far away from your opponent. When you want to bring your hips underneath to lift the person, you have to close that distance first. Right. right. So immediately you're falling into this hierarchical thing of like, okay, you're attacking, I'm defending. Mm -hmm. As opposed to if we're locked up 50-50... I'm attacking, you're attacking. I'm attacking, you're attacking. We're doing offense and defense simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Once you bring your hips back and you have that stiff arm, I'm saying, okay, I'm doing defense. Now you're doing offense. It's kind of the equivalent of playing football. Right. One person is on the drive and the other person on defense, right? It's a little bit more clear cut. I see. So now how does the offensive person break through this? Right. Right. And now they're capable of doing it more successfully if they're very experienced because they could only focus on breaking the balance and the posture and right. trying to force their technique as opposed to now you're not really worried so much about the person Sanagi, the person's Uchimata, person's Sotogari. You don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's sort of the advantage. And you have to, it's hard to really put to words, right? A lot of people say, oh, don't be in defensive posture because you can get slammed Uchimata right away. Right. It's like, really? You're going to throw that guy, the wrestler that's, going like this with their hips back you can just throw a muchimara at will not really you can't you can't yeah. right but there is an advantage there for being uh in the offensive side like the drive you, you can yep. play to your you, you are the driver now you're the driver the, yeah yeah but you know also from a defensive standpoint you're winning you know right. there's 30 seconds left in the match all you have to do is hold on for another 30 <laughs> seconds Right, you need that. You need to be able to do that. Right. right? So you have to be. It, it falls into the general overall strategy. It's like never bring your hips back and never stiff arm. That never. That it's bad advice. That makes because me. You need to be able to do that. Yeah, that makes me wonder. You. Um, so say you're a BJJ practitioner. You learn some judo, and you're yeah. you're trying to you, you're trying to compete in a BJJ competition. Mm where you don't really have to take the person down to win. Well, you yeah. just have to take them down to the ground, so may. So would you yeah. recommend, would you still recommend like being upright and trying to be more positive in the mm. takedown game for in that situation? Or do yeah, you because you get two points for the takedown. Right. You know, this is the thing, like those high amplitude throws don't get really rewarded. Right. right? Whether you launch them with a belly-to-belly -belly suplex Mm -hmm. Or whether the person goes for a, a guard pull and you catch their ankle and you drive them to the ground, you right. still get the same two points. Right. You know what I mean? So would I go posture up? I would definitely start grip fighting. Right. Right. Grip fighting. Because if I have the sleep down first, the same I they don't know how to grip fight at all. 
right? right. So then you grip fighting, you have one hand on, and you almost have to assume that they're going to go pull guard there. Right. Right. So then catching Kochi, catching the leg pick there, and then ending up top, scoring a quick two points would be sort of a good thing. I see. But will I try to stand upright to force an Ipon Senagi? No. Right. You wouldn't Can even I? really. Yeah. You know, yeah, I might because if they're like, you know what, judo guy, you know, maybe I want to test my skills and I'm going to yeah. lock up upper body. You know, it happened to me when I fought in a jiu jitsu tournament once. Right. This first guy right. had no clue who I was. He was like much bigger than me. Yeah. He wanted to lock up. I was like, God bless you. Boom. <laughs> right. And then the second guy, as I'm doing my second match, the guy's like, he does judo. Uh-huh. Right. <laughs> and then uh, he was like, oh, shit. You know, yeah. and he like sat down right away. And then, uh, you know. You had to play your guard game, or, like guard pass and whatnot. Yeah, that, right. I'm not going to try to stand up and throw him there. Yeah. You know, because he's just sitting to the ground. Right. right. So it's like you kind of have to adjust, you know. Right. And then in BJJ2, if they're pulling guard, there's a transition game. They're transitioning down to the ground. You could attack that. Right. I see. Yeah. You're not proactively taking them down. That's sort of the reactive transitional game. Right. And you have to be prepared for it. Right. You know? So the game changes based on the rule sets. Right. But that's the thing. You don't want to play it just to the rule sets. You want to be able to grapple, right? Right. Overall. And that's what your goal is in practice. So right. So you have to have a tournament strategy, general tournament strategy, and then you have to have a strategy just for training. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I see. And then you have to be able to adjust and maneuver the levers and say, here, I have a competition coming up. I'm going to do this. And that's partially why I don't like competition because you're just training for that for one thing. Yeah. It's a very restrictive grappling thing. Right. Yeah, we, yeah. we, we had to change uh, our practice structure drastically for like like coming up to, uh, for competitions yeah. and whatnot. So, My guy Luca's yeah. doing that right now. He wants to compete. Oh, yeah? And he, you know, Luca, big Luca. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he has no, none of this stuff. None of it. You know, he's been doing it for a very long time. Like the transitional Newaza, he doesn't do any of it. And so I'm like trying to teach him little by little. Right. The Newaza of just attacking the turtle in a competition setting versus like, ah, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, hooks this and over under that and then the seatbelt that and you grab the wrist and fight weak side, strong side, you know, back attack. <laughs> it's like, forget all that stuff for competition. You know, we're going to go 30 second goes. Yeah. Right? I miss Sanagi, you're attacking it. You miss Sanagi, I'm attacking that, you're defending it. Right. We're going to do 30 second goes and we're going to do 10 of them. You know, that's, yeah, that's very directed. Good. Yeah, that's good practice. That's deliberate practice, right? Right. Okay, now bail out Tomonage. I go for Tomonage. You're gonna over under split and pass it. You're like, what about the, the nikat sliding thing? I'm like, forget that because it's not gonna work in competition. The guy's gonna roll to his stomach. Yeah, you know, only do over under passes now. Oh, this sucks. I'm like, I know it sucks. <laughs> Can we just do randori? I'm like, no, man, because the the guy is gonna, you know. <laughs> No, <laughs> it's not gonna work. Yeah, not gonna. That's a yeah. You got to do Randori, but you know what if this is the reason why you lose? You know, and this right. is why we got to prepare for that specifically. Right, right. That's yeah. That's an interesting balance. I mean, I think you do need to practice that side, but then yeah, because it's boring. Who you know wants way, to do that? Yeah, you know way. But I, don't it, do like, that. I remember you told me like in Boston, you guys would do, you know, over under passes like. Hundreds of yeah. times a day just yeah. to get good. Yeah. It's like drop Basically, San Agi Juji. You yeah. Know, you're like 30 times in, you're like, holy moly. Yeah. And then you know, <laughs> it's like, what's next? Like, Tomonagi split the legs. You're like, jeez. <laughs> and then the drill after that is like, Tomonagi inside turn, opponent turns in. And then you're like, oh, yeah. turns out. It's like, oh. And then you're like, you've been 45 minutes in and you've been doing the same thing every single day for the last eight months. You're just like, holy moly. But it's, you get good at it. Yeah. I mean, look at Kayla and Travis. Work for that. Yeah, here's a Olympics. story for you. Yeah. Jimmy's fighting this guy. Uh, not Jimmy. Uh, Travis is fighting this guy who he's never beat. Yeah. Russian guy or Georgian guy. And Jimmy yeah. goes out there and he goes, yeah, you know, this is going to be tough. They just train in training camp and Travis got thrown or whatever it is. And Jimmy goes, maybe the guy goes to his back. Which means maybe the guy goes for Tomonaga and you over right. under pass and pin him. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. What? Yeah. That Guy's was exciting. Really good. Yeah, you know, I'll class him on his feet, whatever it is, and the guy goes for Tomonagi or something. And Travis is like, got you. Boom, over under pass. Guy's trying to turn out. He knows oh. exactly what to do because he drilled it every single day for 45 minutes for the last 10 years. Right. <laughs> for that exact moment. It, it was, it was, a, a, yeah. Yeah. And it's a good percentage of times that you end up in that position. Right. Bailout attack. What can you do? Sumi Tomonagi, Ipon Sanagi. Right. Okay. <laughs> so he goes, Ipon Sanagi, I'm going to go for these chokes. 
If he goes for Tominaga or Sumi, I'm going to go for the over-under pass. Right. That's it. There's a good chance you find yourself in that position. Right? Both times, reactive, Nawaza transition, always, always going to happen. Mm-hmm. So and if you're good at it, right? But does, do I want to teach that every single day and have everybody drill that every single day? Yeah. If, you know, if my goal, goal to go was to, to make... Olympics, yeah. yeah, everybody goes to the Olympics, everybody's training, everyone's competing, then that's that. But who's going to sign up and do that? Right. You know? <laughs> Nobody. And is that good to be a over, you know, good, well-rounded grappler? No. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's... So, it's a that's a interesting point about the competition uh, training yeah. and whatnot. Well, now we talked a lot about setting up to a throw, the grip fighting, yeah. and then how to establish dominant positions and dealing with all different postures and whatnot. Mm. How about the throws themselves? You know, a lot of times I hear you only need three good throws to be good at judo. Yeah. The three tokui wazas, whatever. Do you yeah. think it needs to be? Uh, more like, oh, you have to know a little bit about everything, or do you really think you only need three and kind of throw mm-hmm. away the other ones? It really does come back to your overall strategy and your physical abilities, and right. it comes down to the individual judoka. Right. It really, really does, and body type has something to do with it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I spent years doing uchimana, but sometimes it's hard to get it on people with longer limbs. Right. If you can't outgrip the person, it's hard to do Uchimana because if you're in losing position, you're going to get countered. Right. Especially if they know how to counter it. Mm-hmm. If they're taller, they can outgrip me. I'm not going to be able to throw them Uchimana. Right. Especially if they're taller, they can outgrip me and counter it. Now I'm screwed. Yeah. But in fact, that's all I got. Okay. What's my other technique? Ouchi. Hmm. As a means to go into the Uchimana. Kind of a same, similar technique when I'm attacking the inside of the leg, right? Right. Okay, so that doesn't work either. What's my third technique? Osoro. You know, he's taller than me, reach. has yeah. control of my body. Now I'm done. There's no right. way I'm going to... Unless I could beat him in the... Tra- then then that's a good example of, okay, I have to transition to a newaza. How good is his newaza? Right. right does, do you have an over-under pass? Can he capitalize on my mistakes, right? All these different ideas come into play. But, you know, there are people who are unbelievable at this sort of a thing with Ipon Senagi. They know... If, Freaking 30 different ways to enter Ipon Senagi. If they could get their hips and arms across the body, the center line, right. they could finish it. There are people like that. you know. Mm-hmm. So it's two different schools of thought. I think there's people that can train five hours a day. Like if you look at the Japanese team, yeah. they all have a favorite technique. Mm-hmm. Right? They train five hours a day. They've done millions and millions of repetitions for this one technique. They know all the defenses, all the lines of right. reactions. You know that That's something to be said about that. Right, but if you're learning judo in a hobby setting, which most people are in the United States, that's really not the way to go. I think. Right. You know, because you could drill uchimata ten thousand times, but if you can't fight for position, mm-hmm. how are you going to use that technique? Right. Right. So it's contextual. Right. You know what the I guess the main point you're trying to say is no matter which path you take, you have to be able to utilize. Like you have to be able. To, your breath has to be big, uh, wide enough that you can, you know, react and counter react to yeah. different situations. Yeah. You can either yeah. go with a lot of techniques or focus yeah. on a, a few techniques with a lot of varieties within them, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. There's some yeah. techniques that everyone should know, right? OG. Right. Yeah. It's a good one. You know, opens them up, goes back, and then sets up your forward attacks, mm-hmm. right? But a lot of these judo techniques are similar. Most of your turn throws are all turn throws. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Right. So it's like the footwork's the same. It's like, ah, uh, you know, do I want to develop a uchimata or a harai or a tayo or a koshiguma or a go? They're all kind of the same. You just turn your hips. Right. right. And you can't really turn if the person has double shoulder posted on you. Mm-hmm. You know, if hips are far away and their hips are lower than yours, it's going to be very difficult to get lower and underneath. Right. Right. So all these different things matter. And having mm-hmm. a coach that can sort of guide you is good. Right. And, you know, maybe you say, oh, this guy's defensive, so I'm going to do Tomonage. All of a sudden, you're doing Tomonage as part of your game. Tomonage, mm-hmm. Tomonage, Tomonage. That person's going to be like, okay, I'm getting thrown with Tomonage. I'm going to start posturing up a little bit and bending my knees a little bit more, right? And then leaning back. Now, all of a sudden, it doesn't work. Now, you have to do something else to get your right. judo better. And that sort of pattern is going to help you develop that specific subsection of your entire strategy. And then I go with Peter, who has one-handed judo attacks, going left side, you know, three yeah. or four different attacks. I'm going to get good at that, right? So when I do encounter someone that does something similar to you, 
I know how to deal with it because you helped me deal with it. Right. Right. And every, every time I know how to stuff those different things, you have to come up with new ways to get better and best me. Right? Yeah. And one time it was a Tomonagi that you caught me. Right? <laughs> now I'm like, okay, that's an opportunity for Peter, right? He turns to the left, has three or four different attacks, and he goes Tomonagi to that far side. Right. Which you hit me with once, right? Yeah, and I, was like, <laughs> I can count. <laughs> I remember right, that so moment. Now, yeah. yeah, so now it's like uh, people who can do that, I've sort of seen it before. Right. Right. If I'm fighting someone that has very good transitional Newaza attacks, I've encountered those things. So I could defend those things, mm -hmm. right? And it's hard to put your attention on everything all at once. So it's recognizing this pattern. This guy fights kind of like Peter. He has this left side situation. Right. I fight, uh, you know, Gurlitz or something. He does these different things, right? He likes the close range judo. Yeah. I'm familiar with it because the close range judo, I've done this with him many, many times. I do these things. He does these things. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Close range, I use that sort of as a reference. And he's lefty. Right. right? So that's why you need to train with a lot of different people. Right. If you're training just to win, though, I have to put this word out there. You're not. You're doing yourself a disservice because you're right. not putting yourself in that left versus right. Use Gurlitz as an example. Close the distance, right versus left, hip to hip. He loves right. that place. If I'm finding him to win, I'm never going to be in there because that's what that's his favorite spot. I'm going right. to post, strip it, get away from it. Every time he goes, I'm going to bail out. Right. I won't fight in there. I just won't if I'm winning. But. If I'm putting myself there in practice and allowing myself to get launched sometimes, right, I can learn that position that he's very good at. Right. So the next time I fight someone that can force that specific position on me, I'm going to be familiar. Right. Right. And yeah. that's sort of a general a strategy to judo in your training. Training. Yeah. Methodologies. I see. So then now we talked about the actual grappling part of the yeah. judo match. So now it's... This is getting towards more like judo match specific things, but you know, when you go out there, it's not just about being good at judo. You gotta uh, typically your day consists of multiple matches because it'll be a tournament. Yeah. So like match management and yeah. like playing by the rule, like playing mm. the rules a little bit. All those outs, out, ex, external factors, I guess, outside yeah. of the uh, match kind of matter too. So any. Any strategies in that that you like to think yeah, about? For sure. So you, you got to play the rules, right? Right. Uh, if the person doesn't have any good mat awareness, and I used to, this was something that I used to struggle with too. Like I'll be right. trying to throw the person, trying to fight the person. Before I know it, I'm like stepping into the red and the person kind of shoves me out of bounds. And now all of a sudden I've gotten penalized. Right. And I'm down a penalty, right? Happens again. You know, I might be able to throw him. I'm feeling like I'm going to throw him. We're doing it wasn't. I'm doing all the right things, but I step out of bounds again. Oh, shoot. Two penalties. I get another right. one. I'm done. Right? Right. Now, all of a sudden, I'm fighting back. I'm like a little bit desperate. Right. To play the rule, you know, the getting the penalty card situation. Force right. penalty, force penalty. And some people are very, very, very good at that. Right. You're playing the game, right? Because mm. it's a game. Mm hmm and people are like that's not real judo. It's like it is judo. It's part of the judo. It's competition, mm -hmm. right? And that's another thing. That's another subsection of of it that plays a big part. Forcing right. penalties, right? So if I have you know one exchange, exchanges where me and you grip up and go for stuff, transition to the ground, the referee says stop, or the match action stops because we mm -hmm. go out of bounds. That's one exchange, right? So the first exchange, you know, you're offensive. I'm kind of defensive. We get dragged down to the newaza. The referee makes note of that. Right. Second, second exchange, I step out of bounds. The referee makes note of that. Third exchange, I step out again. He's like, penalty. Right. Fourth exchange, you've attacked and attacked and attacked, and I do no attacks. He's like, yeah, this guy hasn't attacked in four exchanges. Penalty again for Shintaro. Right? So appealing to the referee and playing that rule, the rule set, the rules, like that's a big part of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's a fair and legal Part of it. Right. Some people are very good at appealing to the ref and like, oh, look, I'm going for all these different things. <laughs> or if you go for a Sanagi, it's like, wow, he's just dropping to his knees. You know? <laughs> you're going to make a little show of it, I guess. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like when you're soccer, you get shoved and you fall down and rolling on the ground like, ah, my leg. Yeah. You know, he kicked me and broke me and broke my leg. And then the ref's like, okay, red card, get out of here. It, he didn't really injure him. Right. The guy's playing next, next uh, you know. What is it? Next round? Next match? Next next match? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. that it's people like love to hate on that, but all, there's a lot of incident. People, soccer players do it because a lot of times refs miss it with if they just don't flop around a little. I That's guess. true. Yeah, yeah. and like, I mean, I like, still hate it, but yeah, I I do too. And 
But yeah. I can't I can't say much because, as you guys know, we talked about this. But you know, I kind of play that a little uh, in one of the <laughs> matches. So yeah, yeah. that uh, yeah, I think uh, it's the the caution the the warning games is very yeah. important because especially like as you go higher up, um, you know when. Uh, you know the skill levels are very very much equal you yeah. know nothing much happening all even little things like the, the uh, match management makes a lot of difference yeah yeah so like yeah so you, you got playing the rules you know you got burning the clock you got to cl- manage the right. clock when you're out there when you're training sometimes like oh there's 10 minutes on the round or five minutes on the round you do one round you go another whatever it doesn't really matter that much right right like, oh i'm tired and you know managing the clock has a lot to do with just your gas tank right you know that for me at least it is right yeah. because it's like oh man you know i'm out of shape or i've been training right but when you're in a competition it's like you're up by a score there's a minute left that's two exchanges right mm-hmm. it's like he has two opportunities to launch me you know, do I know what's coming? Can I control his sleeves? Can I do this? Has it, what if he gets me, be, outgrips me both exchanges? Right. Likelihood of him throwing me in the last minute is pretty high, especially mm. if I'm tired. Right. Okay, so what do I do? What's the best method, right? And I look at a coach who's very skilled and say, okay, burn the clock. Nawaza, force, force Nawaza. Right. Right. So maybe I force Nawaza and now all of a sudden, as opposed to actually going for things that's going to submit him or choke him or turn him. All I'm doing is trying to create movement to improve position slightly. Right. So the timer resets. Mm-hmm. Right. So you have a mental clock of like one, two, three, four, five. Nothing happens. Referee stands you up. Right. Okay. He misses the throw. He's down in turtle position. One, two, three, four. I sit him really hard to the side as if yeah. I'm going to try to pull him into my lap for the crab ride position. Right. Okay. Timer resets. I could return him back to his stomach after that. Right. One, two, three, four, five. Now I'm looking for the arm bar and I'm threading my arm and going for it. Mm-hmm. Okay, he's going for something. Let's let this thing continue. One, two, three, four, five. We're locked in. Okay, I transitioned back out of it. Now I have the over under thing, the uh, seat bug grip. Right. Now I'm sitting to the opposite side. Oh, he's going for something else. One, two, three, four. Now you've already burned 30 seconds, 20 seconds. Yeah. Mate, back up to the feet. Okay, last exchange, 30 seconds left. He comes in, outgrips me, boom, he's about to launch me. I go Tomonage. Now I'm in Back Nawaza, to the guard place, yeah. Right? And then instead of holding the close guard there, I go for a Juji. Oh, he's yeah. going for Juji. One, two, three, four, five. Looking for the sweep. He's getting tipped over. Oh, is he going to tip him over? One, two, three, four, five. Right? Time but, management. Just clock management. Burning it, burning it, burning right. it. Right. You know what I mean? That's, so yeah. that's another type of a strategy that you can only really gain through experience. Experience, yeah. Yeah, and I was great at burning the clock. Really good at it, you know. So the, Whether I was winning or not, I was just I get tired, so I would just be like, "Oh man!" Did you burn it through Nevada play like that, like just like you just described? Usually, you no. Know, when I was competing a lot, I wasn't very good at Nevada, and I didn't uh, like Nevada. Right. So I didn't really try to do anything, you know. And a lot of people told me the stuff that I'm I, I preach now, but I, it wasn't a big part of my game. Right. Because I was always so confident that I could throw someone on my feet right right so i like preferred to be on my feet mm-hmm. even though it wasn't always the case like it was kind of like you like, just felt more comfortable on your feet i feel more comfortable yeah. on my feet so it's like i didn't really want to force nawaza like why bother if i miss it if i go for it if i miss it you know my tank wasn't very good right i right. wasn't known for my endurance so if i'm like forcing a turnover or something if i don't get it oh i've burned some you know tank so yeah. like tank management is a real thing you know if you gas tank yeah right so like i never really Played especially I was because I was in the wrong division, right? So if the person's much right. heavier, right? If I'm trying to do nawaza and it's a lot of weight that I'm trying to move, mm-hmm. it just wasn't part of my my thing. So how did you burn your burn your time? On the yeah, feet? just doing that, you know, on my on the feet. Yeah, well, you said. Oh yeah, so gripping's great for that, right? So if right. I'm up, just gonna grip fight, grip fight, one hand on and go for bad turn throws or bad right. tomanages to just force it into the ground. Mm-hmm. You know what I, I mean? See, but I then see. if I'm going with somebody that's a good Nawaza guy, and if I knew that Nawaza is better than mine, yeah. I would try to avoid that. Right. You know? A lot of dancing around faking moves, a lot of dancing around faking moves, mm-hmm. kicking the shin, trying to bring them to their knees so that I could go behind him and hold that position as opposed to go for anything. Right. And right, preventing right. the person from pulling you know, me into the guard position. Right. By just sticking to him real tight. Right. And as they're trying to go for the guard situation, like rolling into guard or something like that, I'm preventing it and moving. So then the time is kind of burning. 
mm-hmm. things like that that I would try to do. But you know, I was a decent competitor. I wasn't a great, great competitor. I wasn't like an Olympic top level competitor or anything like that. But thirty fourth in the world though. Forty third. Forty third. Who's counting? Oh, forty third. One, time. One yeah. time, I I touched that. But <laughs> that's pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. There was uh, we covered a lot about the judo strategies, like from gripping yeah. all the way to match management, all the you know nitty gritty. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Any uh, parting words for the audience? Stara? Nope. Uh, just yeah. find me on Instagram. Find me on YouTube. Check out my stuff. I right. have a couple of judo fanatics DVDs coming. One of them being stiff arming opponents. Good. Yeah. And one of them being Tomoinage, which is all the stuff that we were kind of talking about today. Right. If you have any questions, reach out to me on Instagram. And then if I have time, I'll respond. Cool. All right. Thank well, you, Peter. Thank you. Um, and stay tuned for the next episode, guys.